So over the past week, there have been several topics that I've had kind of just like rattling around my brain, and none of them felt like the timing is right or that I could actually uh, make a thesis uh, based on what I wanted to talk about. They just weren't strong enough. And so I was just sitting there thinking, I'm, I want to try to get out something once a week. So this morning I woke up and I'm like, that's a great idea. Let's do a video on that. You've been putting that one off for years, so let's just go ahead and do that. Plus it ties in with the whole witchcraft divination thing that knucklehead did to try to figure out the date of the rapture and all that kind of stuff. Before I get into this, though, I've been watching, and I don't watch Chooch. I watch Bruce. And I've got the same microphone. Should it, is, is this the way that I'm supposed to be doing this? Is it, do I need the thing in the frame? <laughs> Why? It's the same microphone. Set it outside the frame. Look, you can hear me just fine. Matter of fact, I think I got it on 50%. <laughs> it doesn't need to be. Anyway, enough of that. So the word I'm going to cover, I wrote down on this little sticky years, years ago, and I was hoping that I could find more information about it. And it's something that doesn't, there's actually not a lot of information. And this, if you look this word up, says it's a fictional word. But I hope to make an argument to show that it's not just, there's more to it than that. And this is just where I'm going to start from, because that's, that's where we need to start. So the word is megapolosomancy. I know. Basically, mega meaning big, polos meaning city, and omancy meaning divination and uh, magic, basically. So it is a fictional occult science uh, created by Fritz Lieber. Um, anyway, the, it's the art of predicting and manipulating the future through the existence of large cities. Uh, and so um, come down here and a little bit more to it than that. It says basically it concerns the physical, the psychological, and the paramental, the spiritual effects of certain substances, including steel, electricity, paper, and so forth, as they accumulate in the cities. So again, going back to this is fictional. Um, what I want to point out is because I, had, I couldn't find a word for this. And the word that I'm looking for is dealing with architecture as a way to... Um, as far as spirituality goes and, and, and dealing with the occult, because there is a specific architecture that you will see. And I'm just going to give little examples of it. Um, but, oh, by the way, um, but as far as cities are related, if you're not familiar, Washington, D.C. is actually laid out in a pentagram. Yeah, they, you know, like that road is actually not there and they, they don't have a road leading here and here. Oh, there's two roads missing. But again, it's actually laid out like this for a reason because it was the people that actually um, built this country. Uh, maybe there were people that were, you know, Christians or whatever that were influenced and all that kind of stuff. But at the same time, there's a lot of occult that is still, as a matter of fact, uh, you won't find this in Encyclopedia Britannica. I actually got blasted for this uh, because this person was a part of the university system, which also was designed and, and invented by the um, Roman Catholic Church. Um, sort of probably as a response to people um, translating the Bible into English, and since burning them at the stake wasn't doing anything, then they decided, okay, well now we've got to control the flow of information, and so they basically invented the university system, so now you get this whole plethora of stuff. Plus, there's so many occultic things in that setting as well, just in a graduation alone. But the White House is actually named after a Jesuit uh, priest called Andrew White. And uh, people just assume because it's white, it's the White House. Um, but, uh, you know, and then you got some of these monuments and stuff like that. And then the George Washington Monument. What does an obelisk have to do with George Washington? You know, you go to the Lincoln when you got it, you know, a, a statue of Lincoln and uh, et cetera, and so forth. But what is that? And it, it really is just that subtle thing of we've grown up with all these lies. We've grown up in the world. I mean, the world is Babylon. Anybody that makes the argument that it's the United States of America, they need to, then they need to move because it says come out of her. Well, obviously, if it's the world, you're not coming out of that unless you start to acknowledge some of the stuff that's going on in the world itself. And then you decide, I don't want to have anything to do with that. And subsequently get called a legalist. But if you take a look at where Washington, D.C. is 
And the first thing that got my attention was it's the District of Columbia. And I'm just like, well, what is that? What does Columbia have to do with that? Uh, and basically, Columbus discovered that. So that's, that's really what they had. But we got a full district. That means there's other districts out there. And then as you dig in further, you'll find out um, that the city, the town that Washington, D.C. got, well, replaced it, was Rome. They actually was Rome. Um, again, flimsy evidence on that, but the one thing that does get my attention is when it comes down to where they placed it, they placed it on two states. One is Virginia, and the other one is Maryland, Virgin Mary. So yeah, there's a lot of influence and especially with all the Roman influence. I mean, they, they don't call it just the Catholic Church. It's the Roman Catholic Church. And so you look at all the architecture in D.C., and there's a lot of Roman architecture out there. Anyway, so back to Google Maps here. Uh, and, oh, by the way, the Google machine caught me when I was down in Vegas. So there's that. So when we're dealing with architecture, we're kind of fed this on the uh, fictional side of things like all of these spooky sort of TV shows and movies and stuff They will always have houses with uh, this kind of look to them and they have that look of that trapezoid there And that is an occultic symbol the trapezoid But for the most part they sort of just kind of put this and said ooh, okay These are the spooky people. This is what what to expect in, in this particular um, Here's another house. Uh, this is the from the movie psycho, which I think they tore down uh, if I heard I didn't even look it up but I thought in passing years ago they might have torn it down but anyway they got the same trapezoidal uh, look to the top of it and you know they're kind of gleaning from that architecture itself now again I realize we're not dealing with a mega city here but we're just dealing with the architecture of certain buildings um, I actually got a chance to photograph it when I did the tour of the back lot Universal back in 1997 so it's like, great, great picture, Hamrick. Why don't you try to get more trees in it? Well, I was on a tram. I did the best that I could while passing by. So anyway, that's one of the things. And the trapezoid itself um, lends to the whole, it's basically the unfinished pyramid. Uh, when you remove the all-seeing eye, then you have a trapezoid there. And so it has something to do with occult spirituality. And then we're just sort of given it as sort of a fictional thing, like, ah, oh, it's not real. Don't pay any attention to it. And then they kind of keep you from looking at what is real because you grow up around it and it's just normal. So I pulled this up. Uh, this is uh, basically just, you know, did a search of old churches. And you're going to notice something amongst these churches. There are going to be three components in most of them that you're going to see. The first component is going to be the steeple they put on all the churches. I mean, that is the classic sign that, hey, this is a church. And some are done in the different ways, whatever. but this is just, you don't even look at the Church of Mormon where they got basically, I think, six spires on theirs. But anyway, it's got the steeple. The steeple goes back to the sun god, Nimrod. When he, uh, the, that, there's various stories and myths out there, but basically the people that worship the sun would erect an obelisk. Again, back to Washington, D.C., and this one, from what I, I've been told, I guess they say it's 555 feet high with another 111 down in the, the ground, giving it 666 feet. Um, but anyway, the, when Nimrod was killed, um, it's, they cut him up into a bunch of pieces, and I've heard conflicting uh rumors about why. One was basically his body went out to all, uh, all the world, the known world at the time, as a warning. Uh, and then some, it was sort of a spiritual thing, basically saying that he owned the area or whatever. But anyway, and then there was the uh, trying to find all the pieces. So it's not all cohesive. Once you actually study it, it it's just like there's, there's little pieces here and there because it was just passed down over the past 4,000 years by word. But that the one piece they could not find was his penis. And so the obelisk represents Nimrod's phallus. And so you'll see pagan sun god worshipers, they put phalluses up all over the place. Um, next time you watch in the movie Gladiator, you look inside the Colosseum and you'll basically see all those uh, structures. <laughs> Sorry. Anyway, let's get back to the church. We look at the other two symbols that they put in churches. The second thing is going to be this little round window. I mean, not all church will have them, but you're going to see them in a majority of the churches that usually follow the same pattern when building their churches. You've got the little round window. Oh, there's one there. Uh, and on and on. Uh, here's an older 
church with it. And so even the depiction in some of these like little uh, stock drawings and stuff, you've got your steeple, you've got your little round window in there. And that goes back to representing the, uh, the pagan calendar. Let me move me over here just for a second. And so you've got on the uh, pagan calendar, you have eight witches' Sabbaths. So starting with Yule, and then you work your way through the, the year, and then you restart again. Um, and so Yule is actually technically 19th through the 22nd. Um, the sun god is reborn on the 25th of December, because that's when the days start getting longer at that point. But it's based on the solstices and the equinoxes. And so technically, Ostera, which we call Easter, is supposed to be on the 19th through the 22nd of March, but they move it because they don't want it to ever coincide with Passover. Because then you might get a, a hint that Yeshua was the Passover sacrifice. Um, but anyway, you've got these, these ones, and Christians, you know, celebrate some of these. Um, I mean, we don't call it Samhain. Um, we call it Halloween, and so we dress up and go out and candy. It's all kinds of fun, all that kind of stuff. It's actually something that I've never done before because my mother considered it to be pagan. But, you know, then we move into Yule, and I remember I was I was eight, nine, ten, somewhere around there, and I asked my mother about, like, what, what is this holiday about? Oh, well, it's Jesus' birthday. Oh, well, why do we get presents? Actually, it goes back to Nimrod and the legends that encircle him. So actually, when people are, are trying to take this veneer of Jesus and put it on Yule and say, oh, no, no, it's, 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 uh, it's Christmas, it's, it's Jesus' birthday, um, a lot of problems with that because you've now stolen, which again, against the Ten Commandments, and then you're lying about it. It's not really Christmas, it's Yule, and it deals with the log, the dead log that, that existed. And so the, the, the legend basically is that when he was killed, his blood landed on a evergreen stump, a dead evergreen stump. And so then when Semiramis, his wife slash mother, came out the next day, it was a full-grown evergreen tree. And it's said that every year on his birthday, he swings by and puts gifts underneath the actual evergreen trees. Huh. They put gifts under the trees. Well, now we got Santa to do that. But anyway, there are pieces. We, we just kind of commercialized it. I mean, when you look at the evolution of basically... Uh, Santa uh, coming from the, the Holly King or the Oak King. I can't remember. One of them goes away and the other one comes in. And I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not, we weren't really taught this. We were taught all the lies about this, but we weren't really actually taught this stuff. But anyway, so yeah, you know, envelope right here. I don't know if that's the correct pronunciation, especially when this is pronounced Sow and, and it looks like Sam Hain. So well, let's just skip over that for now. But you know, do we have any sort of holiday that lands around the February 1st time frame? Uh, yeah, we do, Groundhog's Day. And if you actually you study this out and look at it, you'll find little pieces here and there of where we ended up today with Punks, Tony Phil, and six more weeks of winter and all that kind of stuff. Or it's just six more weeks till the spring equinox. Maybe there's math involved, I don't know, science, whatever. Anyway, so that's what that little circle there represents is the the, uh, the wheel of the year. And then the third thing that you're going to look for is a lot of the doors and windows, the openings come to a point, and that represents the female. And I'm not going to bring pictures up because I don't want to get kicked off of YouTube. What? <laughs> Pretty sure we've all seen what... Anyway... Uh, but yeah, so you'll see the windows and the doors will actually come to a point. That's what they represent uh, in these, these. And it's just interesting that, it, you know, and I guess some of these were just copied, like, oh, this is the way you build a church. And so, yeah, they've, they don't have a steeple on that one, but um, yeah, various things there. So that one of the things, that's why when you look at the law, you will see that sex is an unclean act. Um, so if you had had sex with your wife or whatever, you were unclean until that evening. And then there was some other stuff that went along with the law as far as that goes, but it was unclean because God didn't want his people using it as an act of worship. In contrast, you certainly see that in the pagan world that we live in, where it is an act of worship as far as that. So even that, so now you've got an entire building that we call a church, we go in, we sing little hymns, it's got this veneer of Jesus on it, but yet it has all this pagan sun god worship attached to its look, its architecture, 
this, this occultic building is where we're going to worship the creator of the entire world. Matter of fact, even when you look at things like cemeteries, uh, a lot of them that aren't the veteran cemeteries and the ones that are laid out in a certain way, just random ones, they have a lot of obelisks in them. Um, and this was where I got hurt when I was like trying to bring up pictures of this. And it's like all these cemeteries where they're all like, ah, I want just a regular cemetery. Um, but yep, here you got in the background, let me get me out of the way, but you can see all the obelisks that they use in this particular cemetery. Um, here we go, obelisk, obelisk, obelisk. And they, and so one of the, the lies that they tell you is, so when you go into a cemetery, they usually face um, east. And they're like, okay, well, that's because when Jesus comes back, he comes from the east, goes to the west. No, it goes back to pagan sun god worship, and the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. That's why when you go to Ezekiel chapter 8 and you look up, uh, there's the women, I think it's like, I don't know if it's 25 men or 25 women, but anyway, towards the end of Ezekiel chapter 8, it talks about the women weeping for Tammuz. So Semiramis was said to have gotten pregnant by the rays of the sun. So after Nimrod was killed, uh, and then became the sun. Then the rays of the sun got her pregnant, and then she gave birth to Tammuz. And then Tammuz became the, uh, in this situation, the reincarnated sun god. Uh, and he only lived for 40 years before being killed by a wild boar. So when uh, Semiramis, who eventually became deified as the bare-breasted fertility sex goddess of Easter, um, so when Easter comes around, there's the, usually you do the sunrise service. That's why they call it that. Oh, it has nothing to do with resurrection of Yeshua or anything like that, but it's a sunrise service, and, you sh and God calls it an abomination. And so they've got the Weeping for Tammuz, which is the, um, they're, we, they're basically doing a 40-day fast. And then, then they have the men to the back to the temple, and they're worshiping the rising sun. And God calls these abominations. Well, they are because they're, these are pagan uh, witches' Sabbaths, what they're known to is today. And so that is the reason why the traditional meal after the sunrise service is ham, because he was killed by a wild boar. And I remember a couple of years ago, I said something about, you know, uh, some if you use the logic and realize that for Easter you have ham as a traditional meal, but ham's not kosher, then how did that, it obviously didn't come out of the Jewish faith because they would have never eaten ham. I mean, that's one of the reasons that the uh, Italians stuck pork in everything, because they were trying to figure out who were the Jews and who were not. So anyway, so, and I, you know, as I was growing up over the years, I just, I never understood the difference between, you know, my church that I went to and, and the church that uh, my friend went to. He went to a Baptist church, and I actually, I pulled it up. Uh, it's Tulip Grove Baptist, and they had a picture here just to see what kind of symbols of the, and this is the older building, but again, you got the steeple and you got the, uh, the, the little round window there. Um, so yeah. Um, but anyway, I, again, the word doesn't necessarily fit. I've just not been able to find a better word for this spiritual science that the pagans believe and the reason that they do their architecture in certain ways. And it, I'm just kind of like picking on the basic idea of the church itself. There are far more symbols and stuff inside these churches uh, that even go along with the paganism. And then you've got those churches in Europe that are, they're like, they're literally made from the body of Christ, you know, where it's basically dead saints, dead Christians, and they, they allow them to decompose and they dig up their bones and then they make churches out of their bones. And it's kind of, kind of creepy things like, that is overtly pagan. Yep, they're doing it. So anyway, um, I got sent this. I figured I'd just bring it up considering it ties into the last video that I did. Uh, I thought this was interesting. Considering Angry Santa claims to be a, a prophet now. But anyway, uh, basically, I've been voting for life for 40 years, and this has not changed, and it will not change. Good call on that one. So anyway. So hopefully you guys kind of got something out of that um, as far as the architecture that exists. Again, I know it's loosely using that word, but they don't really have a word for it. And so 
Uh, that's why this kind of sat on a post-it note for four or five years before I finally decided to make this video. So anyway, uh, yeah, a little bit more witchcraft in the church.